This is On The Rise Podcast. My name is Nelson Stryker. My next guest, Madeline Aragon, is a licensed clinician practicing in New Jersey. Her specialty is grief recovery. Madeline, every quarter, holds grief recovery groups for folks out there who have been struck with grief. Now, in most of my episodes, I do my best not to get too personal. But in this episode, talking about grief, it was just very difficult for me to hold back. But for any of you out there who have tremendous grief, this is an excellent episode to really guide you to getting the help that you need to recover from your grief or loss in your life. Enjoy the show. Usually what I do is I uh, start the show with a quote of the day, okay? And um, this one tonight is from Robin Sharma. This one says, change is hard at first, messy in the middle, and gorgeous at the end. So Madeline, what do you think? Actually, I like that quote, and um, I can only relate it to um, what I do as a clinician. In the beginning, um, clients don't want to go through that change, and it can be very messy and difficult. But as we go through the process together and they start um, going through some of the pain and their hurts, they are eventually relieved of that pain, right? And they are all of a sudden starting to feel better and see themselves anew. And that process might take some time and it can be messy in the middle, but it definitely brings out the best in them. And they can look back and look at their process and say, wow, look how far it came from, right? Right. See how far mm-hmm. they've come for sure. Yeah. And, and you know, because change is a, it's not a great word for everybody. Right. right, right. You know, there's just so many people that are terrified of change. Absolutely. Right. Mm-hmm. But being able to visualize it and understand and kind of have that expectation like, yes, mm-hmm. it's going to be messy. Right. Right. But it's those who come out of that mess to the point where at the, the end of it, it makes you appreciate that mess. Absolutely. Right. Yes. So the, this quote was excellent. I wanted to get that in here. So. All right. So look, let's get into the interview. All right. So let's let's take it back. All right, let's, let's go, go back. Let's go all the way back. Um, who was Madeline Aragon? <laughs> all right. Well, I am first and foremost a child of God. Um, Amen. Faith, Amen. faith for me is important. I am a wife. I've been married now for 29 years. Beautiful. I have four adult children ranging from 28 to 21. Okay. Um, when my li- sorry, to, sorry to interrupt, but let's give a <laughs> shout out to Ben. Ben's here. Ben's here, everybody. All right, ben. Ben's here. <laughs> um, and when my little one was um, in middle school, I decided to go back to school okay. and got my master's in counseling. And I am now a, a mental health clinician working for Rutgers. And um, I'm also a grief recovery specialist. I hold grief groups virtually. Um, and I'm also an author. I am. Uh, I co-wrote with um, a group of women, uh, and it's called "Doing It Afraid." And I detailed my um, great title. Yeah, thank you. Mm. I detailed my experience with fear called agoraphobia. Okay. Mm-hmm. Wow. And I actually have a copy here for you. So. Oh, beautiful! <laughs> That's Excellent. For you. Nice and colorful. <laughs> yeah, yes, sticks yes, right yes. out. Yes, it's okay. a great collaboration there with um, women that just talk about being afraid and getting out of it and the challenges they had to go through. That's and so, powerful. Yeah, thank you. That's powerful. Now, I know we could probably dive into that and cover the whole show <laughs> with just that. Right, right. right. But for, um, you know, some of the women out there, you know, that are, that are coming up, that are even just getting into the field right now, mm-hmm. um, I want to speak to them a little bit. Okay. Right. So before, you know, you went back to school um, and, and realized that you wanted to do this. Mm-hmm. Right. G- can you give us like some of the jobs that you had, you know, and kind of like maybe what you learned from from those jobs or maybe even your favorite job or least favorite job? OK, well, I was first the mom. I was a stay at home mom for many years. 
and I um, had some odd jobs here and there. But um, once my son started kindergarten, I decided to go and do a full-time job. And I was uh, started out for a short time as a cafeteria aide at my son's school. Okay. And I loved it. I actually enjoyed being there with the kids mm-hmm. and asking them, hey, do you want ketchup with that burger? <laughs> and so the kids were just a doll. And then um, the school noticed my work ethic and how I would come in with a smile on my face and always interacted with everyone. Mm-hmm. That they offered me a job as a secretary wow. so i came in started um started working as the secretary hit it off very well and then um after three years they asked me to be the head secretary for the principal okay and so i did that for several years when i went back to school i got my master's and then i was like i was still in that position but then something else came mm-hmm. and it was that that um, position that opened up was um, supervisor of the liaison department oh, okay. so i decided that after i graduate i'll go ahead and you know try it out and i did i got the job had a great team under me what i did was i offered social services to a lot of families okay. i provided them with clothing Um, food, whether they needed a linkage to any services that provided them with like shelter or um, transportation. We were that link. So that was really a very good time for me there. Yeah. Yeah. So so that kind of opened it up. Yes, it did. You know, Mm -hmm. so doing that, that social work aspect really helped me to kind of like hone in to our families and meeting their needs and seeing and talking to them was very, very eye-opening for me. And that's when I knew that I wanted to get into the mental health field. And that's when I decided to go for my licensure as a counselor. So this is going to be a warning. If I start crying on this show, okay, I'm just letting you guys know um, because this, it might happen, okay? It might happen. But let's talk about obstacles. Okay. Okay, what was the largest obstacle you would say you had in... You know, you can go personal, you can go professional. What do you feel was the largest obstacle you've had up until now? Well, the largest obstacle that really stands um, in the forefront of my mind is when I suffered through agoraphobia. And if um, those who don't know what agoraphobia is, is the fear of being outdoors. Um, I went through a a very difficult time in my life, and um, I ended up being succumbed with agoraphobia for a good year and a half. I was not able to go outside. I was not able to do those normal things that, you know, I once was able to do. So I was filled with a lot of grief because of it. And um, it took me some time to finally be able to be set free. And a lot of prayer, a lot of just um, putting myself out there. And at times it was very difficult because those times where I was forced to go out and food shop, I literally would cover myself up with a hat, a scarf in the winter time, try to go in as fast as I could and not speak to anyone. Hopefully don't see anybody, just do what you need to do and come out and go home. But I was filled with so much anxiety and depression that all I could do was just cry and cry and and cry out to God and ask him, why am I going through this? And it was a very difficult process, but a lot of it had to do with my, my, my mindset. And I had to literally force myself and kind of tell myself, no, you can do this. You can and you will get through it. And eventually I, I did. Wow. Amen. Mm-hmm. Amen. Yes. Now, did was, uh, you know, obviously because, you know, COVID, mm-hmm. you know, so many of even the, the families that I've worked with. Right. Yeah. Um, and the kids that suffered from that, mm-hmm. you know, not all, as well. Right. Um, so I know COVID triggered a lot of that was that the same situation for you or this was pre-covid this was pre-covid okay yes this was all happening before covid um started so this was definitely yeah before covid okay Mm -hmm. so when covid hit you had already built up that Mm -hmm. that confidence and that tolerance yes to that so you were already ready like i was ready ready but i also understood what it was going what it was actually doing to our students Mm. that i worked at the school I can see how it would trigger their anxiety Mm -hmm. or the depression or, you know, so that for me was a concern. Right. And because Mm -hmm. you had already, you know, gone through something, 
like that you could mm-hmm. relate right yes and, and so when most people you know wouldn't be mm-hmm. able to right, right. so mm-hmm. you, you were able to to you know be a person that could sh- shed some light yes. on that yes right but at the same time you also got this book here right right the opportunity S- came and yeah. i was able to share my story so doing it afraid first of all thank you again oh you're for welcome the copy. You're so welcome. um all right so let, let's let's we could jump into the book Um, powerful Mm -hmm. gripping stories that will inspire you to walk through the fires of life. Yes. Okay. And it just details um, my account with agoraphobia and what I was, that I was able to get through. And not only that, but my relationship with God just became strengthened and renewed. And it showed me who I was. Okay. And it taught me to battle, right? Mm. And... It also helped me to realize that the battlefield is in the mind and whatever we go through, we are, you know, how our thoughts affects our feelings, our feelings affects our behavior and how we can overcome that. And so, yeah, I detail how I was able to get through a year and a half of living through agoraphobia. Right. Mm -hmm. And it all, it always starts in the mind, right? Yes. Yes. And so I guess because, you know, I see you have, you know, co-authors here. Yes. Right. You want me to shout them out? Sure. Why out? not? Charlotte Simone Rosen, mm-hmm. uh, Eva Thomas Johnson, Dr. Elaine Sanders. Yes. And Pache Felton. Yeah. Did I say it right? Yes. All right. So shout out to them. Yeah. Shout out right. to them. It was my professor and mentor, um, Dr. Sanders, that okay. had asked me to come in and collaborate with her. And oh, I wow. went and yeah, and took that opportunity. And I'm so glad I did. Excellent. Mm-hmm. Excellent. Okay. So you, I know you mentioned the schools, um, you know, and, you know, we kind of s- started to dive into that a little bit. Being, you know, a, a school official, mm-hmm. um, what have you been able to see in these schools that's really challenging, you know, for, mm-hmm. for these children in these, in these families? We see now how COVID had such a huge if effect on our kids right absolutely it did have an effect during covid time but it also has an effect on them even now there's an increase in the anxiety the depression suicide ideations right and a lot of them suffer from social anxiety coming back to the routine right when they didn't have that routine during covid was mm-hmm. very difficult so even the challenge of having them stay in the school throughout the day can be difficult, right? For sure. So those things that they once used to do, the normal schedule was disrupted. So coming back, um, a lot of the challenges that they pose, um, as a clinician, I'm, you know, I'm seeing that. I'm seeing the increase of those things. And so that's what I'm, I'm doing right now with them, just helping them to cope, giving them strategies and just kind of give them those tools that they need to empower them to get through all of these things that they're going through. Right, right, right. Mm -hmm. Now, do you ever see, you know, because, you know, obviously with the older kids, you know, they probably all got cell phones in there for sure. Oh, yes. Right? Most of all of them. And I know some of the kids I work with, you know, they can't, you know, when they're punished, you know, and they have bad behavior, it's customary for the parents to take away the phone Mm -hmm, right mm -hmm. but for the most part all these kids got phones yes do you see are you seeing any protocols that the schools are putting in place because i like i've I've heard some schools locking having like phone lockers and all types of stuff like that right is there anything that you're seeing protocol wise in in your school well i know that some teachers do have the kids put them away in their backpacks or there's a special place where they're supposed to drop them off right you know and if they do you know that's where they'll drop off these cell phones but social media has had such a an impact Mm. on these kids right and the moment you see a child being told give me your cell phone oh oh my gosh it's over the way they react it's it's just very sad so I'm telling you, social media has had a lot of effect on these kids and their mental health. Mm. Yeah, for sure. Now, it, this might be a tough one. This is going to be a tough one. So if a, let's say, the owner of a social media company mm-hmm. called you up and said, hey, I saw your ad, uh, what would your advice be if they called you up and said, how can we do better? Mm. That's a great question, what? Nelson. Uh, yeah. 
<laughs> I wow. try. I yes, try, right? Yes. What would your answer be? Or, you know, what mm. would your best guess be to say, all right, well, I think maybe implementing this mm-hmm. could help. What do you think could be something? I, Off the cuff. Wow. Okay. I know, right? <laughs> I told you, you it was me. Yes, you did. You, you were right. Um, I think it's just a lot of um, probably the, the advertisement, the support, knowing that if they're in need of help, okay. this is where they need to reach out to, right? Or, you know, kind of um, bringing out that information to them, having it readily available, mm, right? Okay. Because you, unfortunately, these kids... Maybe they won't stop being on social media. Maybe it's difficult, but yeah. at least there there's an outlet for them in case they want to reach out and talk to somebody. Excellent. That's why it's so important now that we have telehealth, mm-hmm. right? And count now clinicians are meeting virtually with Absolutely. families. I think that's the key. That w- even though like these things are being posed as negative, we can turn it and, and make it good. Some, something positive. Yeah, something positive. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, for being stumped, that was a pretty great answer. <laughs> Thank you. All right. So on the show, we like to focus on goals. Mm -hmm. Um, Where do you see yourself in the next three to five years, whether it's goals for you or even goals for the business? Well, I definitely would love to open up my own um, practice, private practice. That's a goal for me. I would uh, love to continue these grief groups and build up – how many times a year I have it, and the amount of people that I see, I would love to be able to provide um, presentations to different organizations okay. and businesses because I think it's such an important thing to put that out there and let them know how to be able to um, overcome grief, right? Mm. And sometimes, see, grief is universal. It doesn't matter the age, your skin color, your race, right? Your income status, everyone sometime or another is going to go through grief but Mm. the thing is how do you overcome that what are the tools and techniques that you need to overcome grief so my goal is to be able to present that information out to anyone that would like to hear it right yeah now obviously grief is is it's it's such a powerful topic Mm -hmm. right um and and i love how you said that where you know at some point in your life you're, you're gonna have to go through that yes, right yes. Uh, we we can't get out of this thing alive right no. um and so you know and, and we kind of talked about this you know when we, when we spoke previously mm-hmm. because for me it's like how do you get through a group you know without everybody crying yeah, <laughs> in the group it is emotional I you have know to say. Um, yes. h- how do you do that mm-hmm. right how can you how do you keep that together and the thing with me is that um it's so important to have empathy for that person okay right to help them to know that i'm coming alongside with you you're not going to go through this alone mm. and building that camaraderie and that support between each other mm. is so important because yes. they feel supported they feel heard right they feel like there's someone there that's willing to listen and be a heart with ears mm-hmm. and just that alone helps them to open up right wow, because yeah. you build that trust mm-hmm. and they're able to share their broken heart because mm. grief is about a broken heart yeah right so having that person know that i got you Mm. i i get it and let me hear you out is so important giving them that safe space yeah yeah okay so okay i'm gonna try to hold myself together here so for me um grief is very triggering Mm. because i lost both of my parents Mm. my mother passed away when she was 43 my father passed away at 63 um in 2020 wow. november 5th 2020 so it was like covid 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 mm. and he didn't even pass of covid uh he od'd oh, wow. um yeah, yeah and it was his fourth od and he was in a facility he was being treated oh no it's um, heartbreaking yeah it was just you know it was wild because uh, you know i i never expected that mm-hmm. right completely unexpected mm-hmm. it was winter time you know he was trying to get help yeah. right and he passed away there you know so for me like even sometimes you know i'll be sleeping and i'll like even when he first passed away like Mm -hmm. 
I would have dreams of him trying to talk to me, really? you know, and talking to me. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I would wake up crying, mm. you know. And so can you talk a little bit about what some people go through? Yeah. You know, because I know for me that was what I was going through. Mm-hmm. And sometimes, you know, even, you know, I have dreams of my mom, seeing my mom. Yeah. And, and just waking up like... Mm-hmm. If I'm not balling, I'm ready to ball, like right, right there. Yeah. Um, you know, what do, what, how are people coping with this? You know, mm-hmm. what, what things are you noticing mm-hmm. that people are going through that aren't talking about yeah. their grief? Because maybe that's why I'm having those dreams, because all that stuff is just bottled up. Absolutely. It's just imagine yourself like you're a, a, a tea kettle, right? Mm. And all of that emotion, the anger, the sadness, the frustration, right, is all built up. But in the tea kettle, there's a spout, Mm -hmm. right? And all of that is just unable to come out. So it just kind of settles in within you, Mm -hmm. right? So we use these short-term things that helps to cover up temporarily, right? Some people use alcohol Mm -hmm. or, you know, um, sleeping or retail therapy, Mm -hmm. right? Shopping, Mm -hmm. right? Um, you know, substance abuse or sleeping or things like that just to cover things up temporarily. And Mm -hmm. they're not able to really fully dive in into these emotions. And sometimes when someone loses, like, for example, a loved one, they're left with undelivered communications, Mm -hmm. things that wish that they could have said to the family, right? right? Or things that could have been different. So a lot of them use all these short-term things to kind of help them cover or mask right. what's deep inside right you know i don't know about you but sometimes when i'm really upset i might get a tub of ice cream and i'm sitting in front of the tv mm-hmm. watching by the time i'm all well, the show's over i'm done with that tub of ice cream wow. and i'm wondering what how did this how happen? did this happen right like i'm just like wow. masking the pain with sugar which might end up leading to something else right mm. later on obesity or diabetes so we just got to get down to the deep root of the situation and is and that is what exactly are you feeling okay let's name it I feel sad. I'm upset. I'm, you know, I lost my mother. Okay, let's talk about that. Mm. Let's be let's able to share that experience together. Let me hear you out and then right. give you the tools to help you to get through that. Wow, that's powerful. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, so I held it together, guys. Okay, I'm good. <laughs> all right, I'm, I'm good. I'm not crying. I, I'm still here. Mm-hmm. All right. So, all right. So, I mean, that that's pretty much the show. I mean, is there any, do you want to do any plugs um, to let folks know how to join the grief group? Because um, I know you have one going on right now. Yes, I currently have one on right now. It's, um, it's eight weeks. Um, that will go through the end of March. But I will be starting up another one in May. So, okay. if anyone's interested, please reach out. And, yeah, we'll get you hooked them right in excellent excellent all right so so for that email address if you're interested in the grief group for may yes right you would email grief recovery day at gmail.com okay and you can find madeline on instagram at a renewed you that's y-o-u on instagram also uh, the grief group is also on Facebook, right? Uh, uh, renewed you. That's right. On Facebook. Yes. Okay. And that's renewed the regular way you spell it. Y O U. Okay. Yes. Uh, is there anybody else you want to shout out before we go? Uh, just thank you for having me. Absolutely. I really appreciate it. It was a pleasure. All right. So to my rising tide, thank you for watching. And to those of you on the podcast, thanks for listening to on the rise. Subscribe, leave us a rating or a review so you don't miss any level ups from the show. We'll see you guys next time.